Hello. Hey, Tom, how's it going? Yeah, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Hi, uh, yeah, it's Josh here, by the way. Uh, yeah, you good, mate? Uh, fabulous. Yeah, I'm all right. How are you? Yeah, no, that's fine. I was wondering if you'd mind if I, like, recorded it myself, because I put, like, a lot of stuff, like, out on YouTube. No, not at all, no. All right, fab. So, yeah, go on, mate, fire it away. So, um, what's your, are you going to record it and put it out, or...? Uh, just, like, uh, I record a lot of stuff, so I don't know if it would go out there. But, um, but yeah, I was just planning on recording myself, maybe answering your questions. Just yeah, yeah. Yeah, fab. Okay, so I'm just going to pop you on speakerphone. Yeah, mate. Okay, and uh, I'm just going to start off with this little spiel before I get started. So, hi, welcome, and thanks for taking the time to take part in this research interview. The topic that I'm researching is the use of taboo language by stand-up comedians. Yeah. Which include when and why comedians use language that might be deemed offensive by some people. So, I'm interested in gaining personal opinions from a cross-section of people involved in comedy, and I'd like you to feel completely free to express yourself without judgment. And just to remind you, this is being recorded, but it won't be shared with the public, and you're under no obligation to take part, withdraw at any time, and if you need a break or any, there's any questions you'd rather not answer, please feel free to let me know. Okay, fab. Yeah, I think I understand all that. Okay, so, uh, do you have any questions at this point? No, 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 you go ahead, mate. Uh, so I first got into stand-up comedy because um, I was doing a lot of acting at the time and I found that it was really hard for me to be able to do acting and hold down a day job so I was, you know, and be able to take off time to go off and do acting and go and do auditions whereas comedy I could go and just re rehearse it on my own you know, in my own time whenever I wanted and I could just go along to to like gigs as and when I wanted after work so it just kind of became a, like a natural transition for me Okay, yeah that makes sense um, and how would you describe your comedic style? Um, I'd say it's, uh, it's, quite, uh, it's quite alternative and I try to push the boundaries of um, what you would expect of a stand -up, of a comic performer um, and I also try to create non-literate uh, comic moments because I find I feel like they're much more exciting and engaging than um, normal literate comic moments okay can you explain a bit what you mean by that by literate and non-literate so so comedy is um so comedy is according to some incorrectly categorized by plato when he when he um started writing down the various theatrical genres and um so comedy is a theatrical device and is used in various uh, theatrical genres um, and you can write comedy, aka literate comedy, but it's also a non-literate sensation, which is something that you uh, you just feel within you and it takes over you. The best example of that is when someone describes something as um, something really funny happened and I can't describe it. You just had to be there. So I tr and I try and create those moments because I think that they're much more interesting and much more engaging than uh, someone just retelling a joke that they liked. Okay, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so who are some of your biggest uh, comedic influences? Uh, so, my biggest comedic influence is probably Andy Kaufman. Yeah. Um, I also like the work of Eddie Izzard, uh, Matt Groening, and... Um, I think probably also throw maybe Jim Carrey and um, maybe John Candy in there as well. Sure. Okay, great. Um, and how does your personal identity inform your stand-up? 
Um, I'd say my personal identity definitely does inform it, but on a, on a more subversive level rather than an obtrusive level. Um, I think although you can um, use your own persona and your own personality uh, to, to get people to come closer to you in your comedic work and create stronger connections, I think it's not necessarily that healthy for your mental health uh, to be so closely attached to your personality on and off stage. So I try and create a, 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 a minor but a slight divide between me on stage and me off stage and my persona and my personality. Um, I'd say my on-stage personality, in terms of language, um, I think the moment that you are on stage, um, so Carl Jung, he mentions about uh, about persona and sending certain aspects of yourself into the shadow, and I think that that happens, like, I think that that magnifies, particularly with comic performance and being on stage in front of a whole bunch of people. I feel like when you're on stage, you, you're you like a hyper reality version of yourself. So your, your various mannerisms that you wish to accentuate, your various um, subtle uses of language um, only become extrapolated and become much more heightened. So I think I become like s slightly more Mancunian. I become slightly quicker witted in terms of my vocabulary and the way I would interact with people whilst I'm on stage. And I think that's because of the adrenaline. And I think it's because you end up being in this situation where people are watching you and the fight or flight mechanic uh, sets in. So I think that you just become like that tiny bit sharper as a as almost like a a reflex for danger and harm that could come to you which obviously it can't in that situation and most situations but that you know we've not evolved to not be able to see that that danger once you get hit with that adrenaline Uh, so I've been performing it uh, since, uh, like properly, I consider it uh, since 2013, and and I've probably had thousands and thousands of live gigs now. Right. Okay. Um, and would you consider yourself a clean comedian? Um, in in the last 12 months, uh, I think I probably am now because I do a lot of gigs for kids. Um, but that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that my my routine is entirely you know childish or child friendly. In fact, a lot of it uh, is very risque. I just don't swear very often. Right. Okay. Um, so you think there are some things you can get away with even performing for kids? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think people misunder underestimate kids. Um, and they often don't understand how much kids will al allow for you to go with and get away with. Um, and I think that kids particularly appreciate the fact that you're not talking down to them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so are, are there any words, phrases or topics that you consider off limits for a comedian? Uh, I don't think that there is anything that is specifically off topic. Uh, or that you can't talk about. I just think that in order to talk about any subject, taboo or otherwise, you've got to be able to um, have some sort of um, identifier with it, some sort of bearing with it to be able to, one, be able to speak about it cohesively, but also to be able to speak about it in a way in which you don't appear to be uh, coming at it from an ignorant standpoint or a place of attacking, because that's where, in my opinion, a lot of the problems with this is, in that, you know, generations prior have sometimes, you, you know, obviously 
that's a blanket statement, but some people in generations prior have used um, words of, you know, various words in a derogatory or an attacking manner. And that's why I think that we now have that sensitivity around some of them now. Uh, so, for example, um, you know the the N word has got has got immense amount of power, and it's not up to anyone to it's not up to any one individual to say you can do this, you can say that, you can do you can't talk about this or you can't talk about that. But if you were to use the N word comedically as either um, someone of African uh, descent or otherwise, you've got to, I think, be able to justify it um, in order to be able to use it just due to the negative connotations that it's now got historically. Okay. So what, what, what might my justification take, or can you give an example of that? Uh, so, so, bear with me one, one second. I've, uh, I've just got to grab my phone charger. One sec. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Fab. Okay, so yes, so the question was like, what? Uh, what's an example of like being able to kind of use the N word like in a context? Yeah, the word you used was, was used to justify it, and sort of, yeah, what context? I think, I think um, often it's kind of a case by case basis, yeah, of course. but. Um, you know, for example, you could be speaking about how you ex you witnessed an example of racism, and you know you're speaking about it within the third person being used, um, or uh, an example of if you wish to speak about uh, so like Louis C.K. speaks about the word and how someone saying the n-word makes him think of that word specifically uh, and using it as a misnomer so I think in order to be able to use any of these words it's just a case by case and I think your intent um, in in creating whatever routine it is is like key for whatever issue it is that you're trying to raise Yeah, yeah, uh, totally. Well, uh, but that that can be the case with with any with any argument once you start um, once you start you know going into semiotics, you've then got to be able to you know pr it's about proving intent versus um, versus the historical use of of anything. Um, yeah, so I once did a gig where people were talking um, and I told them that they were so annoying that I thought that, that I hoped that they got a terminal illness. No, not that I hoped, that I thought that they were going to be so annoying that they would push everyone away from them and then eventually when they got a terminal illness they would have no one around them and then they'd die alone. Which which proved to be a bit OTT and ultimately lost the crowd. If I could replay that incident, um, I'd because the problem is, is my persona that I am on stage, it like completely kind of broke what I was trying to do. And and then as a result, not only did it lose the crowd, but it also um, 
it was like far, you know, I imagine that someone like Jimmy Carter, who's very kind of poisonous and cutting, could say something like that and then be able to do a couple of jokes and then continue on. But um, for me personally, I would have to replay that event and um, and kind of kill them with kindness. Um, and again, like I was saying, it's all about it's all about like intent and se and semiotics about how things are going to be read. And I think a whole load of that is is visually and how you're coming across in your attitude and how you're speaking and verbosing. Um, you know, you've got to take that into account on top of these kind of risky subjects or or words that you choose to use. Um, I think, uh, so my mind goes back to, um, the, do you remember the Russell Brand, Andrew Sachs thing from a couple of years ago? Yeah. Yeah. I think that, um, so I remember when that all happened and my dad was like, was like, oh, I'm dead, I'm dead upset about that. And I think it's like disgusting. And I remember uh, saying to him, yeah, but if you like heard it. And he was like, no, I think it's disgusting. And and it, I think me being in comedy has made me go, I think everything's got, everything's fair game, but everything needs to be learnt about more in order to, like, not just from the, the performance aspects of it, but also from the audience side of it. You've just got to know as much as you can do in 2019 or 2020 because I think we're so connected and the internet now makes it that if you're not knowledgeable then your your opinion is probably slightly less valid as a result. Mm. Um, I don't even know if that's a, that's a modern thing either, like, uh, you know, but like it shouldn't, shouldn't be. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Um, okay, um, wicked Tom, mate. Yeah, I really appreciate that. You're very welcome, pal. Yeah. And it's, it's good to 